So I want to welcome you to the third and final vision presentation from the three uh, candidates to be the next president of Concordia University. I'm Carl Shanebeck, and I'm a member of the Board of Regents and chair of the search committee. Um, other board members are present with us today, and just like we did last time, would you raise your hand so you could, we could see? Very good. And notice they kind of clump together um, on that. Um, one week from today, um, there will be 17 members of the board, actually seven, 16 of the 17 members of the board will be on campus. But the 17 members of the board will elect the next president one, one week from today. And I'd like to uh, thank the students, the staff, the faculty um, who've participated in this uh, search process that began way back in August. Um, your input and involvement have been um, a great value to the board as they make this critical decision for the future of Concordia. Uh, today we welcome Reverend Tom Reese and his wife Susie back to Concordia. Uh, Susie's out in, in the middle in, in there, thank you. Um, I was going to use a phrase that sometimes used to introduce people. Um, sometimes it's inappropriately used. This is a person who needs no introduction. <laughs> now, I was tempted to use this phrase, but after further thought, um, I, I think he needs an introduction. First, before, because uh, Concordia, in the 17, seven and a half years that he's been gone, has changed. This is a dynamic and a changing institution. Um, we've built and moved many walls during that time. Um, some people will laugh at that. Others, it's an in, inside joke. Uh, but we have built many uh, walls and moved many walls. Uh, more importantly, though, um, uh, all the students and many staff and faculty are, are new since seven and a half years ago. And secondly, Tom has accomplished much in, in the past seven and a half years. Currently, Tom serves as president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Foundation. <clears throat> the board <clears throat> has recognized that his past service to Concordia gives him a unique perspective on the strengths that the university faces and the challenges it faces. And Tom has come to be recognized as, as one of the top leaders in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in financial management and fundraising. And many look to him as uh, an expert in these fields. We've asked him to take a few minutes today to share his vision, and as time permits, we'll take a few questions at the end of his presentation. So welcome, Tom Reese. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, and after that introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> Carl did tell me that for the previous two candidates who were here in the previous two weeks, the auditorium was, in fact, filled to capacity. So. I'm not sure how to take this, but uh, I'll try to let my ego uh, rest at ease. Well, it's nice to see so many old faces, but also see some brand new faces and uh, get to meet some folks today. I had a wonderful tour with some students and one staff person whom I had not met before, and they did a wonderful job of showing me the places on campus that uh, either had changed or I hadn't been before. So there are new things in the last seven years, that's for sure. But there also is no question that uh, I have uh, a soft spot in my heart for Concordia St. Paul because I have served here twice, as we'll get into later, in a staff capacity and uh, have been around in the Minnesota South District in one way or another for uh, 30 years. My wife and I were married in 1980. Our first call was to a parish in, uh, uh, right outside of uh, Anoka. We didn't stay there very long because I became uh, assistant to the president here at Concordia shortly after that, and that was the chance of a lifetime to work for a man whom I admired very much, uh, Dr. Gerhard Hyatt. Uh, left to be, do some more parish work and then came back eventually as um, the chief financial officer before going to the foundation. So it's great to be back and I have never felt like in a sense that I've left, uh, and I really still feel that way today. 
Well, you'll find out, uh, as I've been telling people, that I have a spreadsheet in my head. Some people have a palette of colors, and some people have relationships and other things in their head. I'm basically a spreadsheet in the head guy. There are 20 slides if you like to count. <laughs> because that's kind of nice to know how much longer is the guy going to go. Tim, Tim Utter will be counting. He's probably got his clicker uh, that he'll, there you go, <laughs> that's right. So here we go, I think. There we go. I would like to introduce my family, however, however first of all, and especially my wife, who is with us today, and uh, we have been married uh, almost 31 years. Um, I absolutely adore that woman. That is, picture was taken this Christmas. I think it was actually Christmas Day, wasn't it, honey? That's about when we get the cards out nowadays. Uh, <laughs> off the deck of our home in Burnsville, Minnesota. Uh, I don't know if you got the memo, but there was a little snow in Minnesota this year. And uh, we took that picture there. We uh, have three daughters. The youngest is right next to Susie, and see if I can, there we go. That's Jenny. She is, uh, lives in New York City, right in uh, the East Village. She is the marketing uh, director for a small family-owned clothing company that has about 51 stores throughout the United States called Jay McLaughlin. There happens to be one in St. Louis, which always fascinates us. And Jenny uh, is living the high life out there in New York, crammed into a sixth floor walk up with two other girls. Our oldest daughter, Elizabeth, who's there in the center, is uh, right here in the Twin Cities. She owns a home not too far from Minneapolis or Minnehaha Academy. Some of you may recognize her and others not. She would like to have all of you recognize her. She's one of the co-hosts for a program called Twin Cities Live, which airs at three o'clock every day on uh, Channel 5 right here in town. And uh, she was, uh, when she was a little girl and we were here at Concordia in our staff positions, Susie worked here too for a while, uh, Elizabeth had a microphone in her hand uh, at three years old, would sing with glad sound, she had a little cheerleader outfit, she was out on the floor. We knew she would be our media star from the get-go, so that's Elizabeth. Uh, Jenny, or Katie and Adam, uh, our only daughter that's married, uh, live in Schaumburg, Illinois, and uh, Katie's a buyer for Sears, and Adam works for his dad in a small um, privately owned company that is a manufacturer's rep uh, organization for packaging equipment. That's our family, and we love them, of course, just as you do yours. We do have two grandchildren. Uh, <laughs> they take after their grandfather, as you can see. Henry on the left belongs to Liz, and George on the right belongs to Katie and, uh, and Adam. Uh, Henry is a West Highland Terrier, and George is a Boston, and they have that terrier blood on that's for sure. I uh, was uh, part of the Concordia system. I decided to become a pastor when I was four years old. My father was a pastor. When I worked at Concordia in kind of a media uh, capacity and a public relations capacity years ago during the early 80s, I used to do a lot of recruiting of uh, church work students, and I'd always talk about the three different kinds of callings. There was the calling to young Samuel at age three, you know, that one in the temple, and uh, when, the, when the Lord calls, just go back and say, uh, it's me, I hear you. Uh, then there was like the Jeremiah type of calling who was called when he was a teenager, kind of a young adult type of situation. Uh, and then there was, of course, the call of Moses who was uh, well along. It was a second or third career for Moses. And that still holds true. Well, I was the Samuel guy. Raised my hand in Sunday school and said, I want to be a preacher. Uh, it fascinates me today that I ended up uh, going to the University of Minnesota and earning a master's degree in business with a finance concentration. And that has been a... Uh, a nice fit for me to use both my finance interests and my educational, or excuse me, ecclesiastical and theological interest in the same career. So graduated from Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, served as a parish pastor for just a few months, as I mentioned, then came here to Concordia. Uh, along the way, earned an MBA at the University of Minnesota, and I am a PhD student at the University of Minnesota in higher education administration with all of my coursework done, just that simple matter of getting a topic approved and uh, finishing the research and the dissertation. Any volunteers to help, I'd be happy to see you <laughs> after the meeting. Um, so ordained in 1980, altogether 12 years of parish pastor experience, including, or in addition to that, I should say, I have, I have done a couple vacancies in the area. Lane Seitz, my uh, former ecclesiastical supervisor, would call once in a while with a vacancy that needed to be filled. 
and I enjoyed that. Nine years uh, higher education administration, all here at Concordia. As Carl mentioned, a little over seven years now at the, the LCMS Foundation. And I did have a chance to work in a proprietary business for four years, which was an auditing uh, company, and uh, really sharpened my financial skills with that, that opportunity. So that was a great chance to do some things there. Years ago, I took seriously the idea of writing a personal mission statement that was kind of hot in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, I finally uh, landed on something that not only is uh, uh, to the point, but I think accurately reflects what I believe about myself. My personal mission statement is to bring leadership expertise to organizations which honor Jesus Christ. So even in my 12 years as a parish pastor, uh, probably my emphasis was not in personal counseling, my emphasis was not in, uh, in uh, necessarily uh, making a lot of uh, uh, small group Bible studies and those kinds of things. I admire those skills, I think they're crucial, but I got people in the parish to do most of those things. My gifts were in envisioning the future, strategic planning, executing, budgeting, and uh, raising the resources to make the ministry happen. In addition, of course, to being in the pulpit. Uh, on Sunday mornings. That's a part of being a, an organizational leader for me. The chance to articulate the vision and uh, engage others and inspire others to achieve what the organization can achieve. So that's my personal mission statement. Love to hear yours uh, when we get a chance. Now the vision thing. I'd like to uh, begin maybe with a concept that most of you perhaps are not familiar with. I wasn't aware of this until I went to the LCMS Foundation, and some uh, folks introduced me to the idea of promise, that vision really begins with promise. What is promise? Promise is what we might call an outside-in look at your organization. It's looking at yourself through the eyes of those you serve rather than looking through your own eyes. And we did this at the LCMS Foundation six years ago uh, when I got there. I did, it wasn't my idea. My staff uh, members, a number of them, thought this would be a good thing to do, and they persuaded me. Now we not only teach this at the foundation, but we consult with congregations and with other organizations to help them uncover their promise. And that phrase is real important because it's not to design a promise, it's to actually look at yourself through this outside-in perspective and uncover what you do that makes you compelling, differentiating, and true. And were I privileged to serve as the president of Concordia University, I would like to introduce that, that one of the first orders of business in that first year or year and a half is that we do something to answer this question again. What is compelling, differentiating, and true about Concordia University. And uh, the end result of that, because you're looking at it from the outside-in perspective, there are two related questions. What has Concordia done for others? And can Concordia do the same thing for me? And if we could arrive at that promise uh, as a consistent, uh, commonly held understanding of our university, we would use that to inform all of our planning, our visioning, in fact, our tactical and strategic, strategic uh, implementation uh, would come out of that promise. I'll give you the example from the, the LCMS Foundation. As we worked together at the foundation, we discovered that our promise is that we are the only LCMS organization that offers comprehensive expertise and services to help you plan and direct your passion for giving to family and all ministries of the church, today, tomorrow, and forever. We found out that we were the only organization that had the legal, the financial, the other kinds of expertise that could do this in the Missouri Synod circles, uh, and had that package. And we could make that promise and be confident that we could deliver. We learned that when we talked to former donors and current donors who had worked with the foundation. Remember, it's an outside-in look. And they said, this is what you meant to me when you helped us design our lifetime plan for giving. A couple of things came out of that uh, process. <clears throat> the phrase, gifts today, tomorrow, and forever, is now part of our vision statement. Our mission statement is linking Christians with giving opportunities. 
That's what we do. Our vision statement is where we are going. And the vision statement for the foundation is that every Christian would someday have a lifetime plan for giving today, tomorrow, and forever. And that, of course, means estate planning, uh, giving to your family, giving to the ministries you care about. And when the Lord calls you home, that plan is in place. That's our vision, that every Christian would have one of those plans in place. And since only about one half of 1% of the Christians in the Missouri Synod have such a plan in place, we have enormous job security. We can be working on this until Christ comes again and we'll never achieve uh, the total vision. But it's, it's where we're heading. So uh, those are three guiding questions that uh, I would really like to uh, poke on uh, with, with all of you, should I be privileged to be serve as your president. As I say, then, once you have that promise, it informs or guides the very important uh, processes of articulating vision, stating mission, developing strategic plans that support mission, tactical plans that put into action the strategic plan, and uh, then the resource allocation or the budgeting process which follows those logical things that are unco uncovered. What uh, happens, and we do this, this is not just an academic uh, speech I'm giving here, we do this uh, not only in our own organization but in others that we work with, what happens is the things that you do that are part of the vision and mission remain. The things that you determine together that should really not be there so that resources can be reallocated are moved away. And uh, then those uh, activities generate additional or new resources that can be reinvested in pursuing the vision. And that's a difficult thing to do, but it's a necessary thing to do. Um, and we've found at the LCMS Foundation that by following this process, not only do we continue to serve more and more people in helping them achieve their gift plans, our own organizational net assets have grown by almost 200% in the last seven years. And now that we have those additional resources, we can plow them back into doing more gift planning, which will in turn bring in more resources to be reinvested in following the vision and the mission. We feel uh, at the foundation that we're in a pretty good spot, a sweet spot, where we, have, uh, we will make uh, sm small or slight adjustments to the tactics and the strategy, but they're small course corrections at this point. We think we've got something that we're happy with that will serve us for some time to come. And that's the nature of this process. Again, would like to uh, explore that with the leadership of, uh, of our organization here, should, this, uh, should we become a team and uh, could even uh, noodle on that a little bit with the Board of Regents uh, tonight uh, after dinner. Uh, had a chance to talk about this uh, in some of the small group sessions with some of you today and may get a chance to do that with you tomorrow if you're part of that process. Well, I did take a look at some of the materials. There's one thing about uh, Carl, if you ask him for material, it keeps coming. And uh, <laughs> we had... Uh, in fact, Lynn Walker said, uh, I asked Carl for just a couple things and uh, whoop, <laughs> it all descended on me. So that was good. And I uh, must say that I read uh, just about every page of everything that, uh, unless I missed something along the way. Uh, this was from a wonderful uh, class study, I think it was, you probably recognize that, uh, that did some survey information. And along the bottom here uh, are things that respondents, oops, uh, I did what you told me not to do, Carl. Pushed the wrong button. There we go. Uh, along the bottom here, I don't know if you can read that, but it's not necessary to read it all, but academic excellence, how valuable, rate the level of importance of the following issues. And if you could see this carefully, you could see that the respondents, and there were quite a few respondents, I don't know how many, but it was over a thousand, I think. Uh, if they rated that very important, then that shows up in that uh, bluish color or purplish blue color. And you can see that just so happens academic excellence had a lot of high rankings as being important to this organization. Uh, the next one, additional majors and computers, internet and facilities, uh, student support services, university budget allocations, safety and security, spiritual support, all of that line across were characteristics of the university that you all weighed in on. I'll say this though, what impressed me about that is, uh, uh, I guess academic excellence makes a big splash, but otherwise it's, it's not real clear to me 
what is highly valued at Concordia. And I'll say that that's pretty much my memory of being here. There's a lot of enthusiasm for a lot of things, uh, but oftentimes it's necessary to sit back and say, uh, should we focus our vision? And in that Uncover Your Promise process, we would find out what is compelling, differentiating, and true, and use that information to focus the vision in the places that Concordia should be going in the next uh, one to two to three decades. So those were my observations on that, and you're going to hear from me in just a few moments what I think are sweet spots for Concordia and where, some, where I think some of the challenges. So that's why you came, right? To hear the straight scoop from the donkey's mouth. Another uh, thing I found interesting from that same, uh, same, uh, oh gee, I did it again, from that same uh, survey was characteristics of the uh, next president. Uh, and here you've got proactive, approachable, visible presence on campus, knowledgeable, leadership experience, commitment to Concordia. And, uh, you know, I don't know uh, which ones of those are, look dominant to you, uh, but I can tell you where I fall on that continuum, and I'll share that in just a few moments. These are great questions to be asking in an interim period between leadership. Uh, what do we need in a new president? What are we going to be as an institution in the next couple of decades? I also wanted to say that I uh, went to uh, my research, my doctoral research. My interest in, in my doctorate is in uh, the financial and operational performance of Lutheran colleges and universities. And as soon as I get that research project put together, it's going to be uh, exciting to see what comes up. I'll be the most excited person on the face of the earth. Well, <laughs> second most. My wife would be the first most excited. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, uh, so that's, that's kind of the, uh, the area that I'm interested in. That's my research area. And I've read thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of material in the lit reviews. So I picked one. This is from a recently published work by Martin and Samuels in 2009. Five areas essential to institutional success. I chose these five because I resonate with those. You have to decide, you know, if you think that's a good thing or not in your next president. But right at the top, they would say clarity of mission is essential. And these are for the, the name of the book that this came out of is called Turnarounds. They uh, base their research on working with organizations like Concordia that are small, tuition dependent, always on the cusp. And uh, what came out of that as they did their research with these uh, leaders and mostly presidents, but also others from these organizations? Clarity of mission is crucial. Financial stability, obvious. But in my opinion, clarity of mission has to come first before you can achieve financial stability. They really put a lot of emphasis on infrastructure health. As you think about the deferred maintenance across this campus, uh, that is not something that is uh, to be left to a third or fourth priority, evidently, in their research. If your infrastructure is failing, uh, your chances of succeeding on the long term are seriously damaged. That kind of surprised me but uh, I can see where that might be uh, a clearly an issue. Accreditation transparency, something I understand less than many of you in here, and I've been quite you know, upfront with folks as we've met in small groups today, that I would be dependent on academic leadership uh, and, and have been able to clearly say what, my, what I think my role would be in that. But there is so much academic leadership and programmatic expertise on this campus you know, that my role would be to uh, encourage, inspire, and uh, harness, coordinate, whatever words you want to use like that, because I'm certainly not the expert in that area. But it's very interesting to see that this is on the top five of Martin and uh, Samuel's, Samuel's uh, list. And finally, an engaged board, executive, and faculty leadership. And that really is important to me, that everybody who's in a key leadership position is on the same bus. And if you, I always like to tell my uh, staff, if I call you up at 2 o'clock in the morning and ask you, what's the vision statement, I'm sure you could give it to me. After you said, who is making this obscene phone call? <laughs> and I haven't done it yet, but I've always uh, threatened to, or I promised to do that, and I'd like to see how that would work out. 
uh, when, when we have an engaged board, executive and faculty leadership, everybody understands the direction we're going, understands the vision, mission, and strategy, has had a chance to weigh in on it. It's got to be a very uh, collaborative and uh, participative process. But eventually, once those directions emerge, then leadership has to hold their hand on the tiller and continue to move forward uh, and not be changing the map all the time. That's really, really important. And that's uh, what uh, they're saying, and that's something I resonate to, so you should know that about Tom. So in my view, I put together a list of what I think are four of Concordia's strengths. And uh, no one is personally mentioned on here, unfortunately. <laughs> so if you thought, gee, I wish he would have said, you know, uh, Bob DeWerf. <laughs> But, but four things that I really value about this institution after having been around it off and on for a long time. First is the entrepreneurial spirit that continues to exist here. Uh, I was here on campus in 1985 when Dr. Loma Meyer came back with an idea for a brand new thing called a degree completion program. And everybody thought, that's interesting, probably isn't going to go anywhere. It's not college. It's different. It's, you know, on and on. There were, there were concerns about it because it was so different. And as all of you know who, have, uh, who care to know and have an ear to the ground around here, had it not been for that early foray into the degree completion program, which was the first really in Minnesota, that's what I mean by entrepreneurial spirit, uh, Concordia would be a very challenged, much more challenged place today. Out of that uh, degree completion program came uh, online programs, came uh, full degree programs in uh, cohort settings. Uh, then came uh, the laptop university concept. And over and over again, for a small school like Concordia, I see this as one of the most entrepreneurial of the Concordia University system, really. And uh, there are others that are doing an equally good job, but uh, CSP can hold its own. And I'm hoping that that spirit uh, exists here today and has not been tired out too much by repeated budget cuts and uh, financial challenges, because we would need to have that spirit, in my estimation, to move forward effectively. Uh, diversity is a, another strength that I have happen to value, and it's diversity in both uh, uh, race and ethnicity, as well as uh, socioeconomic diversity and uh, religious diversity, a growing religious diversity, which I think is terrific. So I'm on record for that. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the great gifts that Dr. Holtz has given to this institution, in my opinion. Uh, when I served here under Dr. Hyatt, I loved Dr. Hyatt. And we had a very uh, strong financial operation, but you could go down to Snelling Avenue and uh, say, I'm from Concordia, you've all heard this story, and they would say, well, gee, great, how was the drive down from Moorhead? Uh, now, lots of folks in St. Paul know Concordia through uh, the diversity of uh, programs as well as students that have come here. And I, it's just a, a part of the DNA today. The third area is commitment to Christ and culture. Increasingly difficult to do in our world is to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into our culture. And Concordia has a way of managing that walk as well as, or better, than any institution I've seen in the Synod. Uh, first of all, somebody asked me this morning uh, what I felt about the Christian nature of this university. And I said, well, one of my visions would be that every single student, no matter who they are, where they come from, would be introduced to Jesus Christ. Not mean they're all going to be Christians, and certainly doesn't mean they're all going to be Lutherans, but that somehow we would have the chance to speak to folks about the good news that there is forgiveness, life, peace, and grace in Christ. And uh, I see this organization doing that well, but still being very engaged in a culture, not certainly fleeing the culture, embracing the culture, which <clears throat> increasingly in the United States, if not uh, uh, non-receptive to Christianity, sometimes is outright opposed to it. And uh, we are aware of that fact. But uh, we want to continue to be ambassadors of both Christ and uh, culture uh, as, a, as an organization. And the fourth thing I really uh, like about Concordia are its aspirations for arts and athletics. Um, 
When I, came, when I returned to the campus for my second tour of duty uh, in 1999, one of the things that uh, impressed me, of course, as impresses you, is the theater. Uh, what an audacious thing to do, to have a theater like that on a campus this size. Uh, what an audacious thing to do to uh, try to make an imprint through athletics in the Division II leap. And I'm supportive of that and was supportive of the uh, concept of uh, raising the visibility of the arts and athletics. Um, they always have to be uh, weighed and measured and uh, evaluated in terms of their proper position in the university. Uh, everybody has stories about the uh, athletic program wagging the dog. And, uh, you know, I guess there's places where the arts program wags the dog. I don't think, certainly not here. But, uh, but the facts are that uh, the, for a school of this size, uh, it has some aspirations for being something in these areas that are extracurricular. So those were my four uh, that I picked as strengths. I'd love to hear your list later on. In my view, Concordia's greatest needs are, first of all, to consolidate the gains of the last 25 years. Starting with that first foray into uh, adult education and degree completion, and then the enormous uh, attachments of the campuses and the properties that have come, and the development of other new liberal arts-based programs, and the development of student interests and relationships with the community, and all of the things that have happened around here are phenomenal. But I think that they need to be evaluated and perhaps consolidated so that we know where the resources are going to support all of these things. And uh, that's a very satisfying experience. Some people think that's a little bit threatening, and I certainly don't. Uh, it, uh, it's just a, it's actually uh, exercising your strength. And once you exercise your strength, you become stronger, not only in the short run, but in the long run, when you do those types of things. So taking a look at all of the things that have been done, because, you know, for example, there's been a lot of additions to the campus, but there's uh, a higher than uh, acceptable level of long-term debt that accompanies that, in my opinion. And when I was here as chief financial officer, we had a higher than acceptable long-term debt level back then. So we did some, did some things to address that then. And I think we would need to do that today, to uh, take a breather, uh, but not stop, consolidate, and uh, be prepared to move forward as a stronger institution. Having said that, then, of course, uh, you, are you surprised to hear me say that? Focus the vision. Uh, that's another aspect of this uncovering the promise and moving into that focusing process, finding those places that are, um, are for the future and beginning to uh, redistribute resources as necessary to support those strengths. Because there's nothing uh, better than putting your resources into your strengths and stopping to put your resources into your weaknesses or the areas that are extraneous to your vision. So there's where I think we need to have some work. Uh, a third is, of course, then, to achieve financial stability. and. Uh, I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it, we certainly, um, I'm, I'm not trying to brag when I say this, and I don't mean to say that, but uh, when I was the chief financial officer here, here uh, our net assets grew by 50% in that five and a half year period. That's kind of stabilized, have flattened out a little bit in recent years. And uh, partially uh, the discount rate, which has got to be, uh, you know, attacked, and uh, a number of other areas, but uh, We'll talk a little bit more about how I see achieving financial stability, and I think it's so important because without that, we're always, uh, well, somebody told me today uh, in a meeting, we all dread April because it's about April, the fourth quarter, where we get a notice, uh, you know, that, oops, and um, we're going to have to make some, some adjustments in the short run. So we want to avoid as much as possible having to have a bad April. And uh, then, of course, then after that comes redeploying those assets toward the vision. Uh, I would be a very disappointed man were I the president of Concordia if we were not achieving solid operational results by the end of the second full year. And then at the third year, we were reinvesting those into the places where we're going to be stronger in the future. 
Uh, that sounds ambitious, but to me, it's just the way you do business. And I think with the talent around here and the vision, the entrepreneurial spirit, the ability for people and the, the, the willingness for people to be involved in a decent process to get those answers uncovered, uh, that, that's very achievable. So those are my four greatest needs. There's a little bit of a special focus. I'm so proud of myself for using these uh, different little uh, things out of the, <laughs> out of the PowerPoint deal. Uh, I did this without any help. <laughs> you know, I mean, what are you gonna do? Say to your administrative assistant, please help me get another job. Uh, would you take this and put this PowerPoint together? So I've, I've been doing this on my off time. Uh, while I'm, uh, you know, while I'm watching uh, Cheers, or not Cheers, <laughs> while I'm watching reruns of what show or another. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Tim, Tim, what number are we on? Are you counting? Uh, there's, in the current vision statement, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know. So this is not just, this is, you know, family business, but it's nothing you don't know. There are three things in the current vision statement. One, we want to be excellent. Two, we want to be accessible. Three, we want to be affordable. The Apostle Paul said something like this in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. I want to be all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And, but he didn't have to worry about budgets. <laughs> he ran a pretty lean operation. He went to town, made a few tents, then preached. And then he lived off other people. I mean, you know, nice gig if you can get it. You lose your head after a while. But, but we have to have a, I think Concordia, whether it's me or somebody else, has to have a solid discussion on these three competing objectives. Excellence, affordability, accessibility. And uh, you all know this. Uh, it's not a secret. But somehow the lid needs to be taken off of that to take a look at, are we going to be accessible which means a student body with a certain characteristic and capacity, or are we going to be excellent, which means pursuing a student body with a certain capacity and characteristic? Are you gonna to try to blend the two? That's not good, in my opinion. Trying to find a niche, a focus, that is achievable and attainable is the process that lies ahead of you uh, in, under new leadership. So that's special focus. Role of the president. My belief uh, is that the president has five, at least five primary roles. First, to ensure that vision and mission are clear and integrated. Uh, no president should be satisfied to sit on the sidelines and leave that up to someone else. Doesn't mean he's gonna sit there and tell everybody what it is, but he should be willing uh, and institute, if necessary, the process to arrive at that promise, vision, and mission. Make sure it's integrated and vision and mission are clear and uh, then, of course, secondly, act as the chief spokesperson for that. Uh, we look to our president to do that. We want him to be able to say, I don't like to be the spokesperson all the time. At the foundation, there's a lot of people that are leaders, and I like to step aside and let them do the leading. So we have this rotating leadership, but when it comes right down to it, you need to have a president that can articulate that mission and vision, is willing to do it, not only with the population at large, but of certainly, of course, with, uh, with significant donors who have capacity to support the organization. And uh, that is a, a very important uh, role for the president, uh, in my view. Thirdly, uh, set expectations that resources are aligned with mission and vision. That means that, uh, as president, uh, the president has a sense of where the resources are being invested and has, uh, takes, uh, makes it serious business to let the whole campus know that we have to put those resources where they're going to ensure the future of the organization, not just decide on the fly where we're going to spend the money or whatever other resource it might be. I have found, uh, the, serving as president of the LCMS Foundation uh, the last seven years, I've found two things. One. It's easier to influence an organization when you're president than when you're not. <laughs> uh, but it's also, uh, even for a guy like me who eats, sleeps, dreams, and thinks financials, uh, as president, you are one step away from the CFO. 
And so the, the president sometimes needs to make an extra effort to be engaged and understand that, and then to um, be sure that he is on the same plane uh, with his chief financial officer and uh, then articulates accordingly. Uh, chief financial officer, on the other hand, uh, has the job of uh, minimizing the number of bad surprises. And uh, another part of my uh, working thesis for my doctorate is that the relationship amongst the chief financial officer, president, and chief academic officer are, is, the, is the key relationship on any campus. Uh, the University of Michigan uh, discovered this uh, 15 years ago, and I forget the name of the president, but uh, he, he's done some nice consulting and writing on this topic. And, uh, um, you know, it used to be that the uh, president, uh, well, certainly the chief academic officer, was uh, blissfully ignorant of financial matters. And it also used to be that the chief financial officers were considered to be the super accountants, the bean counters. And they were looked down upon as, as really true leaders. In fact, many chief financial officers at colleges and universities relish that. I like to be off to the sideline, I do my thing. I give you reports and you have to, you know, take it from there. And uh, that's not the case today. Those three all have to be on the same page. When Carl and I worked together uh, seven and a half years ago uh, and more, um, we were in each other's laps uh, every week surrounding budget, credits generated, right? Uh, margins and those kinds of discussions. He happens to be a very smart fellow and uh, is able to uh, grasp that. And I'm told that Lon Malley has that same uh, makeup. Uh, so it's uh, putting those right people in the right places to have those conversations. Um, and uh, the president, however, does need to set the expectation that resources will be aligned with mission and vision. Fourthly, the president needs to participate in evaluating institutional progress. We're going to have to uh, decide on what are the metrics that we will use to measure our progress and then uh, evaluate ourselves against those, uh, those goals. And uh, certainly, uh, retention of students, uh, graduation rates, uh, bottom line performance in the financials, and all those kinds of things are part of that. And then lastly, the president uh, must initiate or endorse tactical adjustments as needed. If we have to make a little bit of a change, or even a big change, uh, the president can't leave, leave himself or herself on the sideline of that, but needs to be uh, fully engaged in that process. So the elements of my vision uh, I don't have a clear, uh, you know, here's, here it is, a white paper to give you today. But the elements of my vision as I see it right now would be that Concordia is academically excellent. I have to chew on that to, mean, to decide what that means for the organization. It's spiritually dynamic, just as I've always uh, thought it to be. It's oriented towards student growth and success that the main reason for this institution to exist is to help students move into the next phase of their lives and to experience it here in great abundance while they're on the campus or while they're in San Francisco online. Um, Concordia is responsive to the marketplace. Uh, I don't know where the next great marketplace uh, uh, opportunities are. There are people in this faculty that know where they are. We've got to figure out where they are Try not to make too many mistakes, because following rabbit trails is a, is a very uh, expensive thing. But try and test against the market and develop programs that can fill a need and that Concordia's expertise can, in fact, fill. Uh, it's been done before. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be done. And in our Concordias today, who have a lot of challenges of the 10 uh, schools in the Concordia University system, we have obviously uh, some amazing things happening. Who thought, you know, in their wildest imagination that Concordia University in Portland would have a law school that is fully subscribed for its first year of operation next fall. Uh, who would think that Concordia, Wisconsin would be starting one of the most already well-respected pharmaceutical schools in the state of Wisconsin? And uh, on and on it goes. So we have the chance to uh, look at that and be responsive to the marketplace. And then, of course, uh, in my vision, Concordia is growing in fiscal strength. How do you achieve physical strength? It starts with a clear vision. Uh, it continues with budgeting according to the vision. 
making sure that the strategic plan and the budget are directed toward that vision and not uh, straying all over. Uh, that leaders agree that that's where we're going and are willing and happy to, to be on that train. Uh, it means forecasting conservatively, uh, just simple things. Uh, if you think you're going to have 100 students in a program next year, you know, budget for 88. And force yourself to put the program into that revenue stream. And then limit the bad surprises. Always try to have your surprises on the upside. So budgeting or forecasting conservatively. And then finally comes that whole category of paying attention to details. Uh, and that means a lot of things. I understand that it certainly means on that no student account goes unreviewed, that no student who owes money doesn't get a phone call, uh, that students are helped to find ways to pay their bill, you know, everything that goes into that. It certainly includes uh, the bigger picture of helping students retain and stay, uh, but there's a financial aspect to all of that as well. When I was, uh, I don't know, 26 or 27 years old and Dr. Hyatt asked me to be president of the LCM, or <laughs> asked me to be uh, assistant to the president here at Concordia, and I went into his office one of the first days. This is a man, Dr. Hyatt, who had retired with three stars on his shoulder from the United States Army, chief of chaplains, had an office in the Pentagon, all that stuff. And I walked into his office one day and I saw him erasing his file folders to reuse them. I said, I'm in the right place. So, you know, little details like that. Don't want to be cheap, as my wife would, would hasten to say, but pay attention to detail, details. Finally, or pretty close to finally, uh, we're going to need some help. And uh, this is the whole process of engaging uh, financial and other types of support. Uh, we're going to need financial support. We're going to need support from, um, you know, community leaders that can help us make, make inroads into uh, commerce and industry around here, helping our students find jobs, <coughs> helping uh, them with mentoring and all those kinds of things. Much of that is going on now, but that's a, an ongoing process. But in order to do that, it's a simple four-step process. You identify people who have the potential. You engage them somehow to be interested in Concordia. You ask them for help. And you steward them, which in, in fundraising terms means uh, going back to them to report how things are going and letting them know they're a valued part of our community. And it's really just a cycle. Identify, engage, ask, and steward. And uh, the more people we can get, who are willing and able to help us, the better off we will be. Elements of my style. I view myself as a, a servant leader. Uh, I'm not interested in a, a whole lot of things for myself. I'd rather see the organization succeed, and that's just the way it is. I tend to enlist the expertise of others. <coughs> You're not surprised to see focused up there, metrics driven financially and operationally capable and able to hard, make hard decisions when needed. Uh, very seldom uh, in, the, in my seven years at the, uni, at the uh, LCMS Foundation, I have made two unilateral decisions where most of the staff thought I was crazy. Uh, but they agreed to go along. And uh, in both cases, it worked out perfectly, of course, naturally I would say that, since they're not here. <laughs> But it, it very seldom does, uh, does a president have to make unilateral decisions. Most of the time, it's part of a process. This is the last slide. In summary, in my vision, Concordia is a community that helps students grow intellectually, emotionally, morally, and spiritually, exposing them to life in Christ and equipping them to step immediately into the next stage of their lives. The university is relevant to its chosen constituents, and operationally, financially, and infrastructurally strong. And that is 20 slides. Carl, you're going to ask for questions? Well, I'm, I'm on. OK. We'll try the microphone again. Can raise your hand. I have a couple of mics. I'll get one and uh, go in because uh, otherwise, if you can't, you'll repeat the question. I, will, I certainly will. Okay, the question has the other one, please. Pardon? Can you just grab the other one and send that out to our folks? And when you have your hand come in, you can take it out by the door. 
Is this one? This one's working. Okay, <laughs> we've got one. All right, a question. I can't run to the question, but I can hobble. You, you answered everything. There you go. It's getting close to dinner time, too. That might have an odd coincidence. Hi, how will you balance the needs of non-traditional and graduate students against the needs of traditional undergraduate students? Very carefully. Uh, no, this is a really good question because uh, the landscape has changed a little bit. Uh, in 1999, when I came back to campus and through most of the 90s, uh, the non-traditional uh, machine was kind of the economic engine since already then, traditional student enrollment had leveled off. And, uh, but that economic, uh, that you know, non-traditional thing is not uh, the economic engine it once was. And uh, so we have to look at it from, from that standpoint. So first of all, determining the needs of the two groups, obviously, you have, that's a continual process. Uh, I think it was Craig today, is Craig here? Yeah, I was talking about infrastructure investment and things that have to go into uh, distance education, adult education, and all of those things it has to be looked at. But the uh, on-campus student has, uh, has needs and values and desires, maybe demographically a little bit different, uh, that deserves its, its look as well. So if I gave you a, a definite answer, it would be uh, presumptuous to do that. But uh, somewhere in there, there is a, uh, there is a solution that has in it elements of uh, what are the margins produced by the program so that you can reinvest in those things to make it go. I think it would be fair to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that oftentimes the traditional students are, are younger, traditional college age, 18. Uh, we think of them as certainly needing uh, a lot of often academic support to make that transition to college or university but that may be more true of adults than I think too, so I'd, I'd need to be schooled on that a little bit. One thing for sure, once you have the conversation and set the plan, then you know where the resources need to be invested. What is for dinner tonight, by the way, Carl? <laughs> Oh, where would I plan to live? Uh, in my house, in, uh, in Burnsville. <laughs> no, we, we would plan to live in Burnsville. We have two homes. My wife uh, and I commute right now. We've been doing that for seven years because uh, it works real well for us uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, we would uh, move back. Uh, we would actually live together full time, uh, <laughs> which worries her and excites me. Uh, <laughs> And we live out in Birdsville, about probably what about a mile from the district office. If you know where the district office is. If you're a part of an institution that is is seen as not only tuition driven but perhaps economically fragile, yeah. how do you, as as a leader of an organization, encourage people to think beyond their own concerns about their own jobs or their own departments and, and think about the broader welfare of the institution. Yeah, great question, Paul, thanks. I, I think you do that in several ways. One, uh, by definitely uh, having a process that is transparent and uh, that folks get a chance, if they want to, to look at the process uh, in, in most detail. Second uh, is to uh, have the, uh, the community engage in a process that uh, where, where they have the chance to have input uh, but is evaluated by its potential to get us out of financial fragility. And I think what will happen is if folks have a chance to participate in that and have a chance to, uh, you know, to see the transparency of the process, uh, when a decision is made, whether if they agree with it or not, they will at least say, we understand it. And certainly, people tend to disagree with it most often when it affects them personally. And we would hope to not have much of that happen, try to minimize that. But there's no guarantees. I don't know. I don't know what, I know next year is looking a little dicey. And uh, 
I won't have a chance to have any influence, or no, no president will have a chance to have any influence on that. Uh, but the following years, I would expect that the new president would have the university starting to move in a direction where it feels less fragile. Tim. Right. Yeah, Tim's question is, having worked with three presidents here, Gerhard Hyatt, Alan Hari, and um, uh, Dr. Holtz, I would have worked with Dr. Johnson, but he came in and out of town so fast he didn't even have a chance to, you know. No, uh, did I, was that enriching for me? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Dr. Hyatt, of course, was a mentor, as you might imagine, for a kid that's 27 years old and believed in me and gave me the chance to do some things and uh, put up with some mistakes. Uh, but his thing was, we had three people, and, and they were ahead of their time. Dr. Hyatt, Loma Meyer, and Florence Markin, who were absolutely in sync on the academic and financial future of the organization. And so uh, I learned uh, that whole concept from those people. And then Dr. Hari, uh, you know, I didn't get the chance to visit with him too much, just a year and a half or so. Uh, then uh, Dr. Holtz was a tremendous influence on me uh, in the whole area of uh, cultural diversity awareness, uh, building partnerships, the uh, partnerships are messy. And uh, I guess I would say Dr. Holtz's idea of partnerships being messy, I'm not as comfortable as with the messiness as he is comfortable with, but I certainly value that idea. You know, I think it's important to kind of tie up some of the loose ends or you can't afford to be in some of these partnerships, but beyond that, uh, nobody can go it alone today, and he, he helped me see that. Anybody else? I could sing a song. Okay. We, we are fine with that. Thank Perfect. you very much. All right, thank and, you. Um, we're ready to go.